I'd like to now introduce our panel of discussant uh, very rapidly, uh, which will try to answer you with 10 minutes each, uh, starting first with another old friend of WTO, uh, Pierre de Fregne, who has been uh, Deputy Director General of the uh, EU DG Trade at the European Commission also uh, former head of Pascal Lamy's cabinet when Pascal was a, a com uh, EU commissioner for, for trade and uh, Pierre has a long standing experience within uh, the EU on uh, north-south uh, trading issue especially. There is, uh, Pierre, also another uh, activities that you dedicate yourself to since 2005 and this is academic activities over the international economy. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to recognize you as my former colleague at IFRI, um, that you left in 2008 uh, to serve now in the position of executive director of the Madariaga College of uh, European Foundation. So, Pierre, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jean-Marie. <clears throat> Dear Mr. Long Young Tu, you deserve more than anybody else to be here for the celebration because you belong to the common history of the WTO and China. You actually made history here. And as Pascal Lamy's former aide at the time of the accession, I'm glad to see you back fit and well and still engaged in the fight for the modernization of your great country and its opening up. To be Pascal Lamy's former head suggests a lot about myself, but perhaps doesn't tell the whole story. Suffice it to say that uh, I am agnostic about systems and models. I judge the trees by the fruit. My own creed is that the most successful countries in terms of development are those whose leadership has captured the very peculiar genius of their nation and turned it into a comparative advantage for international trade and development in an open and competitive world economy, and China definitely belongs to this list. Precisely about China, as a, as a Westerner whose Sunday pastime is often to read about China's history, I am perfectly aware of the harm done to China during the so-called humiliation century. And therefore, I am all the more convinced, impressed by China's renaissance since 1949, which I attribute to both the return to independence, unity, and peace achieved during the Mao's years, and to Deng Xiaoping economic reforms both the bold long-term vision of the CCP leaders and the gradual and experimental implementation of the reform. And I see China as a double hybrid. On the one hand, a unique blend of market and state capitalism combined with a one single party system. And on the other hand, an advanced country still engaged in the fight against underdevelopment at home. I believe, like I suppose all of you do, that China's fast rise is both a blessing and a challenge for the Chinese people and for the rest of the world. And what better place than WTO to assess China's performance from those two standpoints, which are the two sides of the same coins. Actually, China's growth miracle did not start in December 2001. Actually, its peak performance predates its entry into the WTO. But entry into WTO was a condition for pursuing the miracle Zhu Rongji and Yan Zeming understood it 
and Mr. Long Yong Tu made it happen. China's accession to the WTO has proved indeed decisive in several aspects. It acted as a formidable lever for domestic reforms, so-called tying to the mast tactic. It provided the Chinese export and FDI-driven growth strategy with a strong insurance policy against protectionism. It generated new interest from foreign investors who have been key actors of China's takeoff through massive foreign direct investment. But the price of the ticket of entry was high for China in terms of lowering tariffs and quotas and adjusting its legislation to the WTO norms. But it was worth it. And it was worth it also because of the accompanying policies put into place by the Communist Party in parallel with the trade liberalization. For China's rise is, I think, the defining geopolitical change of this century, yet much more challenging, though, for the world than the gradual emergence of the U.S. and of Germany in the course of the 19th uh, century. What's remarkable in the outcome of China's rise is its relative smoothness thanks to the very existence through WTO of an effective legal framework for accommodating the entry of such a big player into an existing system. The WTO has proved both robust and flexible enough to make a fair room for that double hybrid country. In return, the entry of China has made WTO truly universal, but it is now today fully universal with Russia's entry into the club, a major move for WTO and certainly a major move for Russia. What's China record as a WTO member? I'm not going to reset here the transitional review mechanism. You're all too familiar with it. Just say, not an, uh, as a former EU official, but as an external observer, I would consider it as an unqualified and major success story, both in terms of the implementation of the very heavy commitment taken by China in terms of markets opening and reforms, and in terms of trade performance. Figures are staggering. Maybe China is still a bit too cautious as an actor in the Doha round, partly perhaps because it has paid a lot at the entry, partly because it generates inhibition among its partners. This the fear of China factor is a practical issue of importance, but also probably because it wants to retain some discretionary power for conducting its uh, industrial policy uh, scheme. Engage in uh, China is engaged, like the US and the EU, in the competitive liberalization race, but contrary perhaps to at least the EU, is giving precedence on high politics over trade content and as a reluctance to go for WTO plus deals. There is a need to go further on GPA accession, on services, on reinforced rule, especially for anti-dumping, for fish subsidies, but there are also good omens. The dramatic move taken by China in the margin of the G20 to grant a 97% uh, 
the duty-free, quota-free regime to LDCs has literally bluffed the world leadership gathered in Cannes. But there is today a perception that the pendulum is swinging from liberalization towards a sophisticated and effective industrial policy with some legitimacy. As I said, I am a very practical man. I hate ideology. With some legitimacy, which is for China to cross the technology glass ceiling of middle-income countries. But this policy doesn't go without risk of failure and of confrontation with its trade partner, particularly in the area of national treatment and of a level playing field. And this fear should be neither exaggerated nor ignored. It's one among the deep challenges brought about by the surge of China. China must realize the magnitude of the shock its rise represents for the world. China and three amounts to a systemic shock for the multilateral trading system because of its size, the speed of change, and the, the heterodox policy it is uh, implementing. The first impact is the change of focus in the global agenda, moving from trade towards a green agenda, the importance of coping with additional pressure on climate, environment, and resources, towards a macroeconomic agenda, the importance of uh, structural imbalances, and the gradual, subreptitious move towards a polycentric monetary system with the internationalization and the regionalization, starting with the regionalization of the yuan. And then a financial, uh, a financial crisis calls for hard decision taken within the G7 and among the main participants to address the deep roots of a systemic economic and social crisis which has been entailed by a governance failure in the management of globalization. The second impact is about, of course, the shift towards Asia, towards the BRICS actually as a whole, as a result of demographic and economic trend, but of course accelerated by the present financial crisis and its consequences in the West. And here, obviously, the fact that we've moved from a G7 to a G20 uh, leading group uh, provides evidence of this uh, shift of the economic weight of the governance capacity, but with a risk of a standstill during that transition from west to east. The door around is on the shelves, the climate deal is in the fridge, and macroeconomic coordination, which is so essential, probably the most urgent uh, objective today, is still on the drawing board. And the last impact of China's rise, the so-called systemic shock, is, of course, the compatibility of models. We're going through a systemic crisis of Western capitalism, no doubt about that, and the Washington consensus is that. But what's the alternative? China has opted why, uh, very wisely so for heterodox policies, despite the constraints put by the WTO uh, rules 
and discipline. But can heterodox policy become a benchmark for most members of the WTO? I have a doubt about that, precisely because I do believe that China is a very unique case. And I just mentioned three uh, aspects of that Chinese, uh, hetero, of those Chinese heterodox policy. The very fact that China has been able to rely on uh, uh, export-driven strategy by transferring massive resources from households to the exporting sector is something you do not do easily and which might prove socially extremely expensive. The second thing is, of course, the industrial policy, which has uh, all sorts of aspects. One key aspect for me is the control of finance allocation by that complex and rather untransparent network of CCP uh, officials, state-owned uh, enterprise, state-supported firms, and, of course, the banking sector. I don't criticize the discretionary power which China is using to make sure that the macroeconomic orientation of the 12 five-year plans, for example, are effectively implemented at the regional, local, and at firm level. It makes sense to think of the consistency, and they use a very powerful instruments, but which can, of course, backlash in terms of efficiency, in terms of collusion risk, and in terms of discrimination against their partners. And this also must be. And I would like to end with the very fact that China, rightly so, and the stimulus, the huge stimulus package of 2008 was already a sign of this trend, is shifting from an export-driven to a demand, domestic demand-driven economy. We have to share the benefit of that move. Uh, in a way, China is changing its comparative advantage. It was cheap labor, hopefully it's going to be more and more skilled and high technology labor, but the new comparative advantage is the size of the market and the pace of uh, growth of this market, and this should be used for the industrialization of China, climbing up the ladder, techno the technology ladder, of course, but make room for the partners of China, which contribute a lot to its development. And now my conclusion will be short, and I concur completely uh, with uh, Mr. Long uh, Young too. Uh, the, the key issue remains uh, the, the consolidation of the WTO system, of the multilateral trading system. There is today uh, an illusion, a delusion maybe, of opting for uh, com mercantilist, I'm afraid to say, uh, PTAs. Uh, this is a risk, TPAs, sorry. It's a risk for the multilateral trading system. In a way, we're going backwards with this. And it's time to avoid the most severe danger, I would see, when regionalism becomes continentalism. Think it over. That's worth thinking over. And here, China has a role to play, as EU has a role to play, as uh, the US, but also any members of the G20, any members of this community. The multilateral trading, multilateral trading system is the backbone of globalization. We should build up in the monetary area, in the norm setting area, in the financial area, based on what has been achieved here in this place, and we should not put it at risk. It's a joint responsibility. Thank you.